Howdy y'all, Dr. Islam here, your poop guru, ready to give you your best poop tip Tuesday. We have a great show tonight. We're going to discuss SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We'll discuss what is the mono diet. Have you heard of this? Do you even know what this is? And we'll discuss can eggs cause digestive issues and your questions live on today's poop tip Tuesday. Guys, let's talk about poop. Hey guys. My name is Dr. Samir Islam. My passion is to give you tips and tricks to help out with your gut health. I grew up in a small town called Odessa, Texas. You may have known that from the movie Friday Night Lights or even the TV show. I did my undergrad at the University of Texas at Austin, no Longhorns. And I did my GI fellowship training at the Mayo Clinic. So guys, let's talk about poop. All right, if you're joining me for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam and yes, I am your Poop Guru. Every couple of weeks I go live on my social media channels to answer your questions you guys may have for your best health ever. If you're joining for the first time, go ahead and put your questions in the comments down below and I'll answer any questions I can live on today's stream. If you haven't already, let me know if you're watching this live or on the replay and also let me know where you're watching this at. Are you watching this locally here in Texas or in Lubbock or somewhere else? I want to find out where the furthest person is whenever they're watching this video. We've had people from Fiji, from Japan, but I want to know in today's video where you guys are watching this at. So we have a great show today. I have three topics that we're going to talk about. We'll discuss SIBO, the mono diet, and eggs and digest. <coughs> cannot speak eggs and digestive health and you let me know in the comments down below if there's a question you want me to answer as well billy it's good seeing you thank you for watching from pittsburgh so far you are the winner for how the longs is for today's video all right so you may have seen in my newsletter now if you haven't subscribed to a newsletter go to my website so you can get a prescription where i talked about SIBO small intestinal bacterial growth or SIBO now let me know in the comments down below. Have you heard about SIBO? Do you know what this is? Do you wonder if you may have this as well? Let's talk about this. So SIBO is, stands for Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth. And what this basically is, it's a overproduction of bad bacteria in the small intestine. So when you have a lot of bad guys, a lot of bad bacteria, they produce gas, they ferment, they make your belly become big, a lot of my patients who have SIBO can complain of a variety of symptoms, whether it's bloating, diarrhea, distension, your belly getting physically big, even constipation as well. And this can be mimic this can mimic other diseases such as IBS or maybe other diseases as well. Now, when we have somebody who has SIBO, how exactly do we as a GI doctor diagnose somebody with SIBO. Here's what we do. There's three main ways we can diagnose them. First one is clinically. If I have somebody who is in the right clinical syndrome, they have the right symptomatology, in the right setting, in the right individual, we can empirically diagnose you with SIBO and maybe consider starting some treatment to get you taken care of. Option number one, very reasonable for us to do this, very part of the guidelines, and it works for a lot of our individuals. This helps to avoid any unnecessary tests. A second way we can do this is that we can also get fluid sample from your small intestine. And so what we do in this in this state is that we actually do what's called an upper endoscopy or an EGD. We go down into the small intestine. I put some fluid, I put a catheter down there. We actually suck up some fluid from your small intestine. We look at it under the microscope to see if you have a normal amount of bacteria in your small intestine or do you have an abnormal amount of bacteria in your small intestine. Now, a couple of downsides with this are one, it is invasive, meaning we'd have to do an upper scope, put you to sleep, and take a look and see what's going on. Number two is that we can't really quantify we can't really quantify the type of bacteria that you have. Do you have more of one predominance versus another predominance when you have bad bacteria? We don't know the answer to that. And number three, you can have some false negatives and false positives with that as well. So you know we may have different tests or different results depending on the tests that we do, which leads to option number three, which is the breath test. This, this is the test that we actually offer in our clinic where you actually ingest a substance, you breathe into a machine, and we can see a if you have a predominance of bad bacteria 
in your small intestine and what type do you have? Do you have methane predominant or do you have other predominant bacteria in your small intestine? That's going to help tailor the types of treatment that we have when it comes to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, last thing about SIBO or another thing about SIBO, if you've been diagnosed with SIBO and you have this confirmation, how exactly do we treat this? Well, there are a couple different ways that we recommend to treat this. Number one, we have to figure out what the underlying cause is because if we don't fix the underlying cause, there's a very excellent chance this condition is going to come back. So there are some conditions which can predispose you to develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. A couple things. Number one, if you've had a prior history of a some type of surgery, whether it is a gastric surgery for weight loss, whether it's some other surgery for any other means in your upper GI tract that can predispose you to have a predominance of bad bacteria. You have a you just have fluid that ends up being stagnant, staying in your GI tract, and that can produce bad bacteria, which in turn will cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Number two, you can have certain conditions that can make it more likely for you to have SIBO, whether it's diabetes, slow motility, or maybe you're taking some medical therapies which can slow down your GI tract as well, including pain medication or other conditions like that. Now, you also may have some other, uh, other uh, um, underlying autoimmune diseases that can make it more likely for you to have a problem with the motility of your GI tract. And so we want to try to correct those underlying causes to minimize that and get that taken care of you. Once we do that, at least we're fixing the root cause, but it doesn't fix the main cause of what's going on. Now, one of the main safe treatments that we offer are antibiotics. So we give medications to help get rid of all the bad guys. And by doing that, our goal is to help replenish the good guys that are there. There's very good evidence that taking a course of certain antibiotics can help eliminate SIBO and replenish the good guys to allow you to have a better gut microbiome and to fix things as well. Number two option are dietary options for SIBO. Now we don't have a lot of great evidence that are specific to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We have anecdotal evidence. We have a lot of things on social media, but in terms of actual science, we don't have that great information. We do know that a diet called the low FODMAP diet typically works very well for IBS patients. And we're seeing some information coming up on how the low FODMAP, low FODMAP diet may be helpful for individuals that have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But once again, we don't have a lot of good clinical data. There's some evidence that maybe a low elemental diet can help out. There's some evidence that other types of diets can help out. But in terms of actual research and data and information, we don't have a lot of good studies to support that. Then lastly, there is the option of doing more natural options to help out with SIBO. Certain herbs, certain complementary medications that can help out. Now we're getting to the realm now of where we're not really at the core of what science is. We're getting on the edges of that, meaning we don't have a lot of good studies that are studying how these herbal therapies or complementary therapies help out for conditions like IBS or SIBO. But we are seeing some evidence it can help out, whether it's elicin or berberine complex or oregano. There are some individuals who have used this to help out with their SIBO symptoms, and it does seem to help out for those individuals. Now, like I said before, we don't have a lot of excellent evidence. This actually does help. It's more anecdotal, more experience, but in my experience, I've used this in some individuals to help out with their conditions. So, big warning I want you to know when it comes to SIBO. You will see a lot of people be diagnosed with SIBO with very unusual ways. And what I mean by that is, this is very popular when we look in the kind of the natural path world, the functional medicine world, or the world outside traditional medicine. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are diagnosing individuals, giving this label of SIBO without the right clinical context, without the right clinical symptoms, and without the right testing that's being done. And I have to stress this because anyone can basically order a SIBO test on the internet and anyone can say that you have SIBO but it takes the right clinical context with the right patient and the right symptoms so even if you have a positive test that doesn't fit the symptoms you may not have SIBO I don't diagnose patients based on a test alone I look at the whole picture of what's going on 
And based on the whole picture, this allow us to see if you have this condition or not. So I have to stress this. Make sure you go to the right doctor. Yes, I say this, a healthcare professional to diagnose you accurately with SIBO. So you don't get a misdiagnosis, go through all this testing, buy all these herbs, buy all this treatment, and not get the results that you need. And I'm hoping in the next couple of months or years, when we have more information on how we can better test, treat, and diagnose our patients who have SIBO. Let me know in the comments down below if you've known somebody who's had SIBO. Have you had SIBO yourself? Have you tried treatments? What work has ha what hasn't worked? I would love to hear what you guys have to say. All right, Amy, thank you for watching from Aloha. All right, Aloha. So far, you are the winner for the furthest person away in today's Poop Tip Tuesday. Teresa, you bring up a very good point. You try low FODMAP and elemental drink. It hasn't helped. Um, SIBO is still there. I would just query whether you actually have SIBO or not. Um, Zoe, yes, small intestinal methane overgrowth can certainly be a cause that we can test for that as well. And Zoe asks, can gastritis mimic a SIBO? Absolutely, 100% it can. That's why it's very important to make sure you actually, you actually have an accurate diagnosis of SIBO and it's not something else. Because you can have IBS, SIBO, gastritis, dyspepsia or indigestion, and it can mimic the exact same thing. So you really have to piece together, do different testing, and try different options to find out exactly what it is that you have that's going on there. Good question. All right, perfect. All right, sounds good. All right, guys, if you're joining me for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam, and if you can do me a huge favor, don't forget to like my like this page, and also let me know if you're watching this live or on the replay. So far, we have a winner of the furthest person out. Um, that is um, Amy. From Hawaii, can anyone beat that today? Let me know in the comments down below. And also let me know if you have a question in the comments. I'll try to get to them as much as I can. All right, question number two. Hey, Dr. Islam, what is the mono diet? Is it safe? Does it work? Have you heard of this diet? M-O-N-O. -O. I had to look this up because I have not really known what this diet is let me know in the comments down below if you've heard of the mono diet or if you tried this basically what this is is also called the monotrophic diet and in essence what the idea is is that you consume only one type of food throughout your eating period and the claims are it helps to cleanse your gut help you to lose weight and help you to detoxify your body so for example you may be that you only eat bananas and that's it or you mainly only eat potatoes and that's it they're very they're different variations of this particular diet depending on what it, what is that food that you're hoping that you're eating i've even heard people be on the chocolate mono diet there really are no rules when it comes to this diet it's pretty much open to interpretation now i saw this people talking about this so i started to look it up and i wanted to kind of review the science because i'm of the opinion that we need to have science to base our study so let me tell you here's what the science says about the monotrophic or the mono diet you guys get ready ready hear that nothing there is literally no scientific evidence that being on this mono diet is going to be effective, that it works, or it's good for you. Heck to the no, man. Don't do this diet. There is no way that limiting yourself to one type of food is good for you, is healthy, it's going to detox you, it's going to make you feel better. You may lose some weight, but guess what's going to happen? You're going to regain that weight as soon as you get off this diet. And there's no way I want you to be on one type of food. That's terrible for you. So if you're wondering what does a poop doctor like me recommend to help out with weight loss, here are five things that I recommend so you can lose weight. Number one, you need to have a, a wide variety of plants and vegetables. By far, a Mediterranean or a plant-based diet, a plant-centric diet is the best diet for your body helps out with your gut, helps out with your immune system, detoxing, and it actually does help out with weight loss. So make the vast majority of your plate for uh, vegetables and plants, this will help out a lot. Number two, you need to have a wide variety of nutritious foods, foods that give you nutrition, foods that are not empty, sugary, or processed. You want a wide variety of nutritious foods. Number three, you wanna to try to eliminate or minimize processed or sugary foods. 
Processed foods have very minimal nutritional value. You don't get full quicker, but they have they 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 pack a ton of calories. This is not a good t way to eat. Number four, which is very critical, you need to keep track of everything that goes into your mouth. So many people, myself included, underestimate the amount of food that we eat, and so we underestimate. What we actually underestimate the caloric intake that we're having. And so because of this, a lot of people make the mistake of actually eating a lot more than what they realize. And if you don't do that, or if you don't come to that realization, you may be eating more than what your body can take. And then lastly, you need to add exercise. So I will tell you, you can't out-exercise a bad diet. So exercise is good for your health. It's an added cherry on top. But if you don't make the dietary changes, you're not gonna lose weight. I will tell you, if you do these five things, I can almost guarantee you, you're gonna lose weight, you're gonna feel better, you will detoxify yourself, and you don't need to be on some sort of crazy diet that doesn't work and has no scientific evidence. Same thing when it comes to keto, paleo, all these other diets, they just flat out don't work in the long run. So if you're watching, for, so guys, I want to thank you for watching. If you're watching for the first time, my name is Dr. Islam, and yes, I am your poop guru. Let me know in the comments if you're watching this live or on the replay, and also let me know if you have a question that I can answer on my live stream as well. So Arusa says that your sister is suffering from piles, which are hemorrhoids. Nothing is working so far. What do I need to do? So hemorrhoids are a literal pain in the bottom. Oh, yes. Yes, I know. I'll be here all night. So it can occur whenever you sit, whenever you strain, whenever you give birth, whenever you're pregnant or you lift heavy things. Hemorrhoids are due to dilated veins in the rectum. These veins become engorged and they can cause symptoms such as pain, bleeding, itching, pressure. Now there are a couple different ways that we can treat hemorrhoids. One is over-the-counter treatments. Whether it's softer stools, using something like a squatty potty, sits baths, warm baths, salt water baths, uh, these things work very, very effective. Number two, you can, you can use over-the-counter ointments to help out, whether it's witch hazel, preparation H. These actually help put a band-aid on those hemorrhoids. It doesn't actually fix those hemorrhoids, but it helps reduce those symptoms get people feeling better. Then you have the two other options to get rid of those hemorrhoids. One is surgery. Now surgery is usually used as a last resort. Surgery is hard on your bottom. Your, your bottom doesn't like to be cut. And if the recovery can be pretty significant, the recovery can be painful. And I have a lot of individuals who had surgery for hemorrhoids in which they wish they never did because the surgery itself was a lot worse, which leads to our next option, which is hemorrhoid banding. This is a procedure that we do in our office that takes about 10 seconds. It's kind of weird, but we place a rubber band around those hemorrhoids. It strangulates those hemorrhoids so they come off, they slough off, and it fixes the root cause of the hemorrhoids. So in my opinion, hemorrhoid banding in the right patient is the best option when it comes to hemorrhoids if over-the-counter treatments don't work or if you don't want surgery as well. Now, there are some hemorrhoids that are way too big for me to fix with the banding, which means that the only other option we have for them is surgery. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's the way it is. It's a great question. Let me know in the comments down below. If you have questions about hemorrhoids or you try these treatments, what's worked and what hasn't worked uh, as well. So Bill asked, great question. Which fiber supplement is best to resolve constipation? Metamucil, psyllium, or Benefiber, weed dextrin? You hit the money right there. It's psyllium. Psyllium by far is the best option when it comes to um, fiber. But I typically also am also a fan of Benefiber because Benefiber is synthetic and it also tends to have a lot less gas. But when you look at the clinical studies, psyllium is what's recommended for constipation, for IBS and conditions like that. So how do we treat constipation? So obviously adding a fiber supplement is going to be the first line treatment. Number two is that we also want to make sure we actually have a poop ritual. Yes, your body thrives on your ritual. It needs to poop at the same time. It needs to have that rhythm going on as well. And so this is why a lot of individuals poop in the morning. Hey, full disclosure, I'm a morning pooper as well. And so I do go at the same time all the time. A next option you can do is that consider having hot coffee or hot tea in the morning. This acts as a stimulant to allow things to pass through, to wake up your GI tract, and then move things along as well. And then consider adding some magnesium at night. This actually allows your stools to become fuller, softer, and allow you to have more effective bowel habits. If this doesn't work, I always recommend add some daily Miralax in your coffee in the morning. Very safe, 
very effective. It allows us to make sure what's going on. And obviously, if these conservative things don't help out, come see, come see someone like me so we can find out exactly what's going on. We can see, do an investigation and see if there's any other reason why you're having the constipation. All right, last question that I have so far. Question number three, Dr. Islam, can eggs cause digestive problems? Let me know in the comments if you are one of those that suffer from gut issues when it comes to eggs. So the answer to this is yes. There are plenty of individuals that actually have an egg intolerance or an egg allergy. So how do you know this? Well, it's pretty easy. You eat some eggs and you have symptoms, whether it's bloating, nausea, indigestion, maybe you burp sulfur foods or you burp sulfur gas or you, you know, fart sulfur gas. This is one of the common reasons to feel like you're burping something sulfur are eggs. And if you have this when you have eggs, and obviously if you don't have it when you eliminate eggs, that is going to be your diagnosis. So we don't need to do any fancy testing. We don't need to do any fancy procedures. Basically, you try eggs, you feel like crap, you don't eat eggs, you feel so much better. That is your clinical diagnosis. So what are options for treatment? Well, obviously the first one is stop those eggs. Yes, don't eat those eggs because you know it's going to cause the gut issues. Sometimes we've seen some studies suggest that vegan eggs may be better for you to hopefully eliminate the gas. There are some studies suggest that eliminating the yolk may be a better option for you as well. But easiest thing, just eliminate those eggs, get rid of them so you don't have those issues like bloating your gas whenever you're having those eggs. All right, guys, perfect. Well, guys, I, I don't see any more questions, so I want to thank you for watching today. If you haven't already, don't forget to smash that like button, like, share, and subscribe. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you get notifications on what my next videos are. Let me know in the comments down below if you're watching this live or on the replay. And I look forward to seeing you guys on my next Poop Tip Tuesday. All right, guys, thank you for watching. Hope you guys have a great and happy day. And don't forget, let's talk about poop. Thanks, everybody.